Yes, welcome Jeremy, Michael, and uh, Martin to the stage. We've got the expertise here. So we're gonna be tackling some of the themes that we've gone through so far in, um, in the conference. And um, if you have a question, of course, raise a hand. Feel free to ask our experts while they're here. But I think, look, um, we sort of covered very well throughout the event so far, the situation, particularly in Europe, and how challenging it is right now. The demand narrative, quite clear. The supply chain risks, quite clear as well from um, all the expertise that's been shared so far. So I wanted to just start off by looking perhaps a little bit more around how public perception might be changing. Um, and, you know, we, the converted at this event, um, certainly uh, believe in, 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 in the sort of narrative and the need for new capital and for new supply to come online. Um, but how do we address um, a broader catchment, a broader market, um, and maybe more generalists is where I'm leading to, um, to sort of pay attention to this industry and start bringing uh, the capital through um, that's very much needed to push these projects uh, through to production. Um, let's, let's work our way across that. But um, let's start with that public perception piece. Michael, um, do you think that things like the war in Ukraine and, and, and the supply chain crisis has suddenly woken everyone up? Or is it too little too late in terms of um, the sort of pendulum shifting? I think that's a very, very, very complex question. I mean, are you talking about the perception of the industry or of the perception like in the general public? Um, I, well, let's start with the industry in terms of people coming to terms with the fact that we need these materials and we need greater amounts of financing. Um, I think that the industry has quite dramatically learned over the last six, seven, eight months and the war in Ukraine has fueled this transition effort. Um, but I still don't believe that the industry fully comprehends or understands. Or from another point of view, you have individual companies and they all see their individual demand for their product. I think they're lacking a full greater picture that the whole industry has a certain demand. And I think that they're still underestimating the, the power of China in not manipulating but controlling certain raw material markets. It's not only lithium, it's not only nickel, it's not only graphite, it's the whole suite of these materials when you look at who is in control of the mine supply, who is in control of the downstream industry, the, um, the semi-finished products that you will need further down the road. And I think the procurement departments still have a very, very strong position in many, many companies and I think that there's a false signal of security because procurement says, yeah, we still got it under control. But only up until the point where the supplier that we just touched upon, like the elephant in the room, when China stops um, delivering product to customers that they have contracts with in favor of supplying their own industries, which they will always do. And this will be the tipping point where things could go out of hand, I think. And the perception, like in the uh, like among us is a total different one than the perception in the industry. Uh, are we going to see these contract defaults um, quite soon? You know, uh, I have no this? idea. <laughs> and I would be lying if I said I know. I I don't. Yep. But because it'll all depend on. I believe that we're going away from a, away from a pure economic driven um, approach we're heading towards um, or we, we will see an increased geopolitical influx on decisions. You see with the uh, IRA of the United States, that will have an impact on investment in Europe. That will go to North America quite possibly. You will see a lot of investment in Canada, the United States and Mexico. The products that will be produced, they will be for the North American market. They will not leave North America for European customers, maybe for European companies, but based in North America. Then you have China on the other hand, and we are like right in the middle as a tiny speck as Europe. Is Canada gonna come to everyone's rescue in Australia? You know, we're seeing these, these moves from um, Canadian policymakers around forcing Chinese um, companies to divest in some of their critical um, minerals companies. Um, 
clearly these lines are being drawn in the sand now, as you, as you, as you mentioned. Um, this is going to make it harder, though, uh, globally, right? Yes. In general, yes. But to what extent? I, that's, that, that's really hard because there's so many components that will have an influence on that. And mm. I wouldn't dare to say it's going to head into this way or that way. I want to dive into something. May I, may I add though, something yeah. to it? Um, I think the Chinese are very important uh, regarding this because they are willing to take more risks. Yeah. And, and, and this speeds up uh, also the, 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 um, the mind development. And this is help, helpful for the whole industry. And therefore, if they, if they are forced to step out, this has a negative impact. Western companies typically take longer for their decision to, to invest. Um, if I might add to this, if you look at the lithium market, if it was not for the Chinese investment in Australia, we would not have seen the development of Pilbara, Altura, and you name them. And so in that sense, we're quite happy or lucky to have them. Otherwise, we would not have 60% market share of Australia into this market right now. I don't, I think we would see, or we would have seen um, a supply crunch already if it wasn't for that investment. And you see, I mean, they do it in Africa. They're in the Congo, Mali. They go into all these countries where we are not going to because we have issues with those countries on geopolitical, on, on governance issues. But we need to attack or tackle those issues. Otherwise, we're just going to be left out of the game. So we've got to get quicker and smarter about yes. deploying capital, essentially. Yeah. Jeremy, let me bring you in because it's a unique project and it's great to have Neo Metals involved here, you know, because you're looking at this, you know, the whole sort of value chain essentially across your projects. Yeah. And that plays into very much the needs of what we're talking about here at this event in the European uh, context. But um, maybe just talk us through what's the Neo Metals experience in terms of preaching to the, 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 the non converted, uh, you know, everyone here you know, sees the value of what you do, but you've got to reach a, a broader, wider audience, you know, the ESG, the impact funds, these kinds of capital providers. Yeah, look, just following on from what both these gentlemen are talking about, I don't, I don't think the public perception is not an issue. That's there. It's in the paper. It's, we talk about it through this whole conference. The reality is that if you take Europe, because we're in Germany right now, if you take that as an example, you've got some big autos and some governments that have set targets and the reality is they won't get the raw materials they need to achieve them, which in my mind in simplistic terms just means all the timelines are going to stretch. So people are going to start to get egg on their face shortly. How do you change it? I mean, yeah, the people with the most to lose from this have to start making investments early. So you've got to change your risk appetite, as was mentioned, which the Chinese are very happy to do. They're, they're gamblers. And uh, as are Australians, so I'm, I'm not being mean. But, uh, you know, to that end, it, they don't have to do all the heavy lifting, but they have to do a bit of it for the fact that once you get a cornerstone investment, for example, then, you know, that certainty begets, begets more and others come in behind it and then capital markets do their job and governments can support with funding. But because there's so much bureaucracy, it's just slow. So what we're seeing as a, as a company that's sort of across and developing projects you know across the battery space is we are seeing support courtesy of ESG tailwinds and that's you know from the get-go so the vanadium project that we have you know it, it it lacks the recovery if you were using traditional acids but you get permitted for example and we just got permitted when you do a site selection if you know if you articulate yourself carefully then you'll have governments coming to you saying, please come to our site and here's what we'll do to help. So, you know, those elements are definitely supportive, but it's not a panacea. It's still, you know, you've got to navigate the whole pathway. It's helpful and people should leverage it, but it's, you know, it's not a guarantee to success either. This sort of integrated thinking is giving you sort of a, an advantage in the conversation uh, somewhat and, you know, thinking about the supply chain view. Yep. Yeah, look, for sure. Moving downstream minimises risk on a number of fronts, diversifies what you're doing. And because we're moving downstream, we get to have conversations, you know, with people at the pointier end of making the products that are purportedly green, you know, and to that end, that definitely helps with the conversation to get 
projects permitted and financed because it's a long old journey and if it takes seven years waiting till year six when most of the I's are dotted and the T's crossed, you know, the company might not exist or the opportunities pass because someone else with a bigger risk appetite has swooped in. So, you know, fairly general statements, but, you know, that's what we're seeing at, at the coalface. But the bar to bring a mine supply online is, is getting higher in some respects, right? Um, so that sort of seven-year estimations, you know, in, in, a, in a positive scenario, right? Um, yeah, very possibly. And, you know, if you don't have certainty over permitting, you're going to avoid certain jurisdictions. So Europe's very keen to have domestic resilience, which means you're going to have to get certain projects permitted. You need faster timelines. You need a guarantee, not a guarantee, but some certainty that actually the rug won't be pulled from under your feet. And that happens and it even happens in Europe and it's happened in Canada, which is not so great. Um, yeah, so that's that's my sense of that in terms of, you know, having having certainty if I may add to this, um, take Mexico or Chile or even Bolivia as an example for this um, certainty issue. When you look at Chile, Chile, for example, right now has a market share in the lithium space, roughly 26%. Because of the lack of a clear and straightforward regulatory framework in the lithium business, in the lithium space, you don't see a lot of projects there because you don't have the certainty of your investment or your return of your investment. And that is why Argentina is so strong with projects, and that is why the market share of Chile will fall to less than 10%, quite possibly in 2030, if they don't change their regulatory framework. Go to Mexico, they just nationalized the lithium business. That's not a very good sign for or, or signal for a possible investment. Or Bolivia, there was a German-Bolivian joint venture project <laughs> where that just got kicked out uh, because it was n no longer on vogue and it was used to get the president out of office. So as a part, um, that was just a part of the story. But all I'm saying is that if you don't have a jurisdiction that will give you some certainty or insurance of your investment, you will just avoid those jurisdictions. End of story. And in Europe, we have not only NIMBY, but I just learned that we have BANANA. Banana is built absolutely nothing near anybody. So this is just like NIMBY 2.0. And um, well, it may sound funny, but at, at the end of the day, it isn't. Because that is what prohibits projects and the development. And that's why some countries that have a lack of governance have a lot of projects developed. And countries like China that have a different approach to things, and they're, you know, they take the risk. They are not afraid of burning money. You just go into those countries, and that is why you end up in situations with these market concentrations as we are right now. Just to play devil's advocate, what is working? You know, there's got to be like we're here at this event. We had Deutsche Bank come and speak uh, on the first day. They've not been in the metal space for a, a cycle, <laughs> somewhat. Um, the banks might be financing other projects. There's certainly incentive pricing in certain metals. Um, we've got the inflation reduction bill that we talked about that's hopefully going to kick capital upstream. It's certainly allocating money to EV charging, um, all kinds of improvements in the midstream and, and downstream. What are some of the positive things that are coming through? You know, um, and are there, it's clearly not enough. <laughs> we haven't heard that, but there's some catalysts that are helping. Yeah. I, look, I think we have focused on a couple of negatives. There are plenty of positives as well. And some of the commitments being made by governments and cell makers on capacity, everyone's following that lead then. And so you might not get the, the quantum of materials that we need in the timeline that we're targeting. But nevertheless, it is building a lot of confidence for companies to come in behind and start developing these projects. It's making think, people think about going downstream or up and downstream being vertically integrated. And, and that's all a good thing because you know, a lot of these bigger companies are, are going to have to take matters into their own hands to you know, fulfil their own destiny. They can't wait for other people. Like if you're a cell maker and you say, well, I'll just let the precursor guys sort that out because you know, they supply to me, I don't think it works like that anymore. If you want something and you know, as a result in Western Australia we're seeing – you know, all sorts of people, Europeans there from big companies that know nothing about rocks and they're out there rolling up their sleeves and learning about rocks. So, you know, it's, it's happening. 
this integration uh, thinking, perhaps, of the supply chain mm -hmm. of corporates, yeah. Okay. I would like to, to add something. Um, sometimes for, for junior companies, it might make sense to work together with, um, let's say, traders, because uh, traders um, can help with um, not only with, with selling the product, but also with uh, giving advice on uh, what's the best technology, what to avoid, and something like that. And we, I observe uh, much of investments also from traders, and uh, this is also also very positive. And in general, I would say, we uh, in the lithium business, we went through a learning curve, and the finance industry learned more and more about lithium, and now it comes to the fantastic uh, environment with its high pricing scenarios and so on, and, and this will speed up investments. Okay, um, let's talk about some of the innovations that might be going on in the space, you know, um, game-changing technologies in areas where the innovation can help the sector as well, maybe around processing. DLE is certainly not a new technology, but it's a technology that um, you've spoken about in your presentation and a lot of companies are touting as, you know, going to be, it's going to tick the boxes of the low carbon requirements of European sustainability standards. Um, and what are some of the examples like that that are coming through that are, again, helping the sector? Do you want to start yeah, with, okay. with some we can see insights? Uh, yeah, so, um, if you have, a, um, for instance, with Brian and TLE, uh, technology, um, if you have an, um, a resource with a relatively low grade, then you must choose or must opt for a DLE solution. You have no other choice because the solar evaporation is uneconomical. Um, um, so, and then we, we see all, all the project, uh, new projects are uh, suggesting to use DLE. But even, even hard rock, uh, we also, I also see not, not, maybe not the need, but uh, we also see developments which are uh, interesting. And I mentioned this with a, with a uh, furnace, um, that you, you can use hydrogen-powered hydrogen, hydrogen uh, powered furnaces. These are available. Interesting, you, you, uh, you say, okay, the energy uh, um, involved in hydrogen is comparable to natural gas. But uh, at the end, you have, there are also issues you have to deal with. I, I, I think I, I heard something about, about the moisture content in, in, your, uh, in your exhaust gas and something like that. You have to manage it. With every new technology, you, you have to adapt your whole process. This is not, and, and that, means, that means there are always some kind of risks. I think, I think this, uh, the, the uh, substitution of, of uh, natural gas by hydrogen is, is simple, relatively simple. You can manage it. But uh, yeah, and, and we should not forget that, that if we talk about no new technologies, we, we will see risk. I, I would like to give a new, an example. I will never forget when I uh, used to work with, with uh, rock with lithium. They made a copy and paste of, of, of a, of a uh, lithium carbonate plant in, in uh, Chile. Uh, and uh, they c uh, were not in the position to bring that uh, new plant to nameplate capacity because they changed a tiny little thing in the process. It was not a 100% copy and paste, it was a 98% copy and paste. And that, that's, that this was some experience I had in the past. Even the, the world market leader, technology leader, had problems with te technology. So we should that, keep that in mind. And we should not uh, only add up uh, the, all the capacities announced and, and saying, okay, we, we, we have uh, in two years, we have uh, additionally 200,000 tons. Maybe we have only 170,000 tons. Some technological risk buffer there. Yeah, you touched on some great points, Michael. Yeah, just wanted to add, um, there will be jurisdictions where you're not allowed to use solar evaporation for new projects. So it's gonna be, again, Chile is a prime example. They stated very clearly, if you want to have a new project, it will not be solar evaporation. It has to be DLE. Now, Why is this? Well, because they say solar evaporation, um, you just pump the brine and you evaporate water and this is water scarcity area. And they don't want that anymore. But as you said before, there's technological... Um, not problems, but issues associated with new technologies. 
and DLE does have some issues with water consumption depending on the process and energy energy consumption. So there is no there is no holy grail solution for it's not like you take DLE and you solve all the problems that you have with the current processing route. And the same with the hard rock route. Yes, you can get the energy consumption down with using um, like natural gas or hydrogen, but that will have implications on other um, aspects of your whole process. So, Can I just probe you a little bit more on hydrogen? Because you, no. you, had, some, <laughs> you had some comments in your presentation, and you know there's a lot of positive discussion around it. But yeah, um, but I think maybe you're a bit more realistic in terms of where we're going to get to with it or you know it's not a cure-all i think is what you were saying um and you know we're talking of technologies and uh, you know it's not going to suddenly switch into hydrogen in the next decade is well sometimes right? um i may sound a bit frustrated so apologies for that but when we talk about green hydrogen the first thing that we need to do is really make it into green hydrogen and that has two aspects the energy that you need for the process to produce green hydrogen and what is your source for the green hydrogen. As I said, water should be the prime source, but just to give you a number, for one kilogram of hydrogen, of green hydrogen, you need up to 10 kilograms of pure water, purified water. How are you going to tell this to people in Africa that don't have drinking water? I just see some social aspects to this. And when you look at to the chemical industry, um, again, green hydrogen is proclaimed as the, as like the holy grail. You just t take away natural gas and, re and you replace this by hydrogen. But there are chemical processes where this is simply not possible because you need the C of the natural gas. And hydrogen does not have that. So if you talk about like a chemical plant like Ludwigshafen, BISF, they, and the amount of hydrogen that they would need would be in the 100 million ton 100 million ton range. And now think about the amount of water that you would need to produce that. Europe is in a drought since 2017. So I just see issues with that. I, it's not a problem per se, it's an issue that needs to be addressed and solved. Yep. And the same with the renewable energy. 84% 80, of the primary energy consumption um, in Germany is non-renewable, it's fossil. 84% in total of consumption in gas and oil and all of that associated. So we are far away from being net zero or renewables only. But green hydrogen only works if you are 100% on renewables. And for renewables, you need batteries again to store the energy for the night. So all of these issues are connected. Renewables, green hydrogen, water, batteries, it's all connected. It's not a single issue that you can address. They need to be addressed in a holistic approach. And that is what's very, very complex. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. And these bits get missed out of the story sometimes. The water point, yeah, it's very um, pertinent to every company that we've got here as well, of course. Jeremy, can I turn to you and talk about the sort of the sustainability pressure uh, in terms of running your operations, doing your business? You know, you're closing the loop with the recycling aspect. Um, but what about things like, you know, thinking about scope one, two, and three standards that are coming through and slowly funds and um, governments are asking this of corporates? And how do you as a junior um, in the space, you know, with sort of capital restraints um, in, on, across certain projects, how do you navigate sort of adjusting your business to these requirements? Yeah, look, I think ESG has has been around for a long time. So it's a new, it's a new uh, acronym for something that's predominantly been there. It's the sustainability aspect that's got the focus on it. Uh, you know, how do we look at it? I think for all companies, particularly, you know, if I, I'm a bit myopic, Australian company, so I think about the European carbon border adjustment mechanism, for example, and there'll be a stick if you're trying to export from elsewhere into Europe with a high CO2 footprint. I don't think that's dawned on everyone, to be honest. Um, you know, equally the opportunity to reduce your, you know, operating costs by generating carbon credits, etc. It's all, it's all really meaningful, but I don't think it's negotiable now. I mean, if you want to go into business, you need to consider ESG. You know, some people are doing that by generating green products. You know, we're trying to do that a step 
earlier by using processes that are green of themselves and then generating a green product. So, you know, from my perspective, the hurdles that you've got to jump over with regards ESG are just part of the norm now. It, it's, it should be normalised. It's what you've got to do. You've got to do, if I give you an example of what we're doing. So in Finland, we're developing a vanadium recovery process. So, you know, the technology is a bit unique and it's got a green footprint. It'll suck in CO2 as a reagent. Touch wood, hopefully we get a net zero vanadium product that Europe's short on. But to do all of that, you've got to impress upon people that that really is the case. You've got to do LCA studies and it's a journey, right? You start off with, you know, because it's a mineral processing technology, you start off with bench work, you go through piloting, demonstrating, and in between you do all the studies. So it takes a long time. Now you've just got to weave in collecting data in order to do LCA studies and then you're in a position to say, look, Here's our CO2 footprint, and it's not just CO2, but let's pick on that. And here's what it would compare to if you were to dig this out of the ground, and here's your percentage saving. You know, scope three is altogether harder, but you need more data and you need to be mature. So my dialogues with green funds, big ones, are at the inception stage because they like, but they need more data. And so I think people just need to prepare early. That's, that's what I'm taking from a lot of different dialogues. I, want, I wanted to hear this because in the past, LCAs were an academic thing, I would say. But now, now it becomes more professionalized. From my understanding, you only need to know what comes in, what comes out. And then you have your databases, take a look to your databases. For me, it's fine to know uh, rough data. I don't, know, I don't need to know the, the, the third digit, digit after the comma or something like that. And that, that's fine. I, I, I only want to know, is it, uh, is it a good process or a bad process? <laughs> yeah, which is great. And, and someone like me will say, it's a good process. That's not enough, though, if you're, someone's going to interrogate what you're doing and you don't need three decimal places, but you do need sufficient data to support what you're saying, which means you've got to go through a methodical process. So, of course, everyone wants instant gratification with answers, But, you know, it's just like a mining project, mineral processing, not so different. You, you need to do a demonstration trial, for example, in order to get really meaningful numbers that people will go, okay, I take comfort in that. I know there's been sufficient rigor in what's been done. So, yeah, at a high level, of course, we come out early and try and say this is better and, and, and it's irrefutable, but then you need the data. Is it really challenging getting all the, 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 the qualitative data? To data no, together not really. I mean, there. up to scope two, no. When you've got to involve the whole industry, I mean, we're learning as well. Let's see what happens. But you have other industry players who will likely feed you with that information because they've already prepared it. Uh, I think really if you go through a process, you've just got to measure everything. You've got to do a mass balance. It becomes an engineering exercise and then it spits out your data. But you have to prepare for that in advance because if you go through a study – or a demonstration trial and you haven't collected everything bearing in mind what people want to know, you're going to get left short. You can't redo the trial or you can, but it will cost a fortune. So I think everyone just has to get their head around the fact that this is the new norm. Just maybe two comments on the LCA side. They previously, previously lacked just fundamental um, input data. This is changing. There's more and more data available for an LCA analysis. Up until very recently, if you wanted to do like an LCA analysis on the lithium-ion battery, you were using data from 1992 from the first Sony cells. This is now, this is changing, this is evolving. So data becomes available and it makes it easier for those analysis. One thing. And the other thing is that, for example, the EU, um, it's, it's going to be mandatory to um, prove that the materials that you are using are sustainably sourced. Um, so you will have to fulfill standards. IRMA is a very, very tight and strict standard, for example. And you will require you, if you are building lithium-ion battery cells in Europe, they will require you to, um, or allow, there will be an allowance of CO2 footprint per kilowatt hour of capacity. And they will also um, mandate you to use secondary sourced materials like lithium and others if you produce the cells here in Europe. This is all going to be very challenging and the goals are very ambitious, but we are on a way to do that. 
So ESG and sustainability are becoming more and more a vital part of that industry. And it will be demanded from the industry, by customers, and also from the regulatory bodies. Does anyone have a question for our panelists or anyone? No? Okay, I, I wanted to pose um, a slightly different question, sort of taking an alternative view to maybe zooming out of what we've been talking about. And uh, it's come from a, a bit of reading I did around tax revenues off of hydrocarbons. <laughs> you know, governments making a lot of money off of taxing oil at the pump, you know. Um, there was something like 3.6 billion for the UK government in 2019 um, off of oil. You know, if we all switch to our electric vehicle fantasy, <laughs> where's this gap in the government funding coming from? And, and, and why is there this paradox now? You know, governments def are definitely strapped for cash right now. You know, I'm speaking here as a Brit, you know, um, but, but um, the public finances piece doesn't match up necessarily with um, the narratives that we've been talking about here. Not um, just to play devil's advocate, you know. Um, how, how do you guys, how do you guys see uh, that unfolding? And maybe another point to that is: should we be doing this conference in Houston? Should we be going to the oil hubs and pitching them and saying, you know, get involved in lithium, get involved in downstream and midstream processing and and metals, bring your capital and bring your expertise as well. Sort of two points there. Right? I can jump in a little bit on an aspect of that. I think I don't think we have to go to Houston necessarily, but you know I'm seeing directly big mining companies that have hydrocarbon exposure looking to diversify away. Like there's no question that they're they're scavenging for exposure to this sector. Um, so let's not fly to Houston, but certainly you know one two one should invite whomever they can because they're all looking for exposure. And they're not all sure how to do it. The OEMs are not necessarily sure on their strategies as to how they want to participate in a range of these things, including, you know, with my, my recycling lens, they don't necessarily know how they want to participate in that. They just know they have to. So, yeah, I think the more people involved, but there's big pots of money that are being left idle. They're here in Europe as well, and they're not sure how, to be, how they should be applied appropriately. So, you know, we've talked a lot about problems, but you know, need more solutions. And I think they're all there, but a uh, journey of a thousand miles. I would like to add that uh, we, we can see examples from the uh, oil or the oil companies. Are, they are investing into, for instance, into the lithium business. I would like to mention this Koch energy, Coke, Koch. Yeah. I cannot, cannot pronounce that. Sorry. Standard lithium, is it? Yeah, they invested in standard lithium, for instance. But um, typically, these companies, first, they invest in renewable energy. And then they are very close. Okay, they need a storage solution. And then they are, they are very close to, to lithium. And that, that, that's the link. So I, I think it makes sense to, to, to talk to oil companies because every oil company is, is looking for a transformation from, from themselves. And we can see total energy in, in, uh, in France and so on. Regarding, regarding the, the tax uh, thing, I, I cannot really give an answer, yeah. On the, on, in Germany, I know uh, we, we, have, uh, um, we have revenues from, from taxation of, of the, these uh, um, fossil fuel consumption, but we have also many subsidies for, for these technologies. Maybe, maybe this can ease a little bit if we can reduce these subsidies for these uh, fossil fuel things, but I have not, not a really answer for this. I, I did hear that some one potential was to tax fast charging. So if you want to get in the fast lane, you want to charge your Tesla quickly, <laughs> you're going to get pay, pay a premium to get back on the city uh, autobahn. Something like that will they will come up with an idea. Yeah, I, I don't have I'm, a concern. I'm pretty sure about sure, that. Sure. Um, but I think this is also a very country specific question, because in my mind we will see a lot of countries where EVs will not play a major role in the next decade. So, um, I mean, there's one major OEM who said, we will go fully um, electric, asterisk, in where markets allow it. So this will be very, very country and market specific. So for the UK and countries in Europe, this might be a question. But like I said, I think our governments are very smart in coming up with things that they can tax. So um, I have no doubt about that. That's the creative part of the government, right? <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Okay, well, look, 
unless anyone's got any questions for our panel, um, I would say I will leave it there and say thank you very much, uh, gentlemen, for sharing your insights. Fantastic.